Welcome to the Clinical Theory of Everything. We're going to talk today about several topics within the clinical theory. The basic overview of clinical theory is based on 30 years of healing work, working with the body energy systems, biocommunication, balancing body chemistry, stimulating and supporting the natural healing processes of the body. Uh, there's so many things that we observe in the healing process that aren't explained in uh, conventional theories of, of physiology and biology and anatomy and chemistry that we, we need to, to go beyond those standard models. And we also need an integrative model that includes all those many views and more uh, in, within one perspective. So that's the clinical theory of everything, basic concept. And so today we're going to talk about states of matter beyond the ones that you've probably learned about in school and, and how those are, are essential in terms of being able to understand the function of body, mind, and spirit and how they work together in the healing process. We're going to talk about the phases of health, which is the five phases of health model that I developed based on the bioelectronics of Vincent. It comes originally from France uh, with their study of water and the relationship to uh, cause of death uh, early studies, nearly going on nearly 100 years ago now, uh, but still used in cutting edge medicine around the world called BEV that measures the physics, the biophysics of terrain. So we're going to talk about that in more detail. We're going to talk about photoenergetics, how light energy, quantum energy, uh, works in, in the body and in healing, in the healing process. Biophotonics, again, light energy and, and how that works in, in chemistry and other, other perspectives. And, and finally, we're going to talk about plasma vessels. And so uh, plasma is one of the states of matter that we're going to begin talking about now. We'll get back to plasma vessels at the end. So states of matter that you're uh, all familiar with, of course, are solid, liquid, and gas. And you can see on the diagram that uh, here's a standard view of the a phase diagram of water, looking at different uh, levels of temperature and pressure and, and how uh, gas, liquid, or solid forms. Well, we, we clearly know that there's more phases of matter than those three now. Uh, for example, the fourth phase of water uh, is a, a very popular book now uh, that details everything that we're learning about a liquid crystal form of water that, uh, that some of the researchers are calling EZ water. That stands for exclusion zone, because just like in the body, as in nature, you know, when, when uh, water forms ice, it excludes all uh, solutes and, and, and other materials from that, that crystal. And so when you form uh, water ice on the Arctic Ocean, it's not salty water like the ocean water is. It's perfectly pure water, except it's a different structure than the structure of water that we've all been taught of H2O, just like ice and this liquid crystal form of, of liquid water that forms the ice as an intermediate form that should show on this diagram if we update it. Uh, it's, it's hexagonal sheets and, and, and uh, it excludes protons as well as the sodium chloride and other salts and other impurities in, in the ocean water. And therefore it forms uh, what chemically is H3O2 minus and, and parentheses around that and an N standing for uh, some number, a large number. It can be millions of sheets of this layers of water that can form in, in a minute around hydrophilic surfaces, including the proteins and cell membranes, the phos, phos, uh, phosphorus-related groups that we have on the, the cell membranes. Uh, so this is living water. It's, uh, I call it liquid crystal water. Again, researchers call it easy water. There's other, other names, structured water, hexagonal water, uh, or other names that you might uh, look up and, and, and review. So beyond this, uh, this uh, standard diagram and, and beyond including the liquid crystal water in the center between liquid and solid, we need to, to expand our view and see that, that beyond gas, there's a, a state of matter called plasma, which in itself is really three states of, of matter, three states of plasma, which we, we can talk about those. And then to the left of the di diagram, uh, past solid is another state called a condensate. The Bose-Einstein condensate is an example of this. Bose-Einstein condensates uh, were, were given the Nobel Prize uh, in, in physics in, 19, in 2001 uh, for research back in the 1990s. 
And since then, for example, in 2010, it was found, it was shown that photons, that light, can also form a condensate. In fact, when light forms a condensate, it has mass. So, so there's, again, more, to, more in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in the philosophy of conventional science. Even though the science exists, the, the, the uh, studies are there, but we need to put the big picture together to understand how plasma and how condensate forms states of matter and the liquid crystal uh, form of, of water interact in the human body, in physiology, in our anatomy, in the function of the, not only the body, the biological body, but also in the function of the mind, how, what is the mind and how that interacts with the body, not only the brain, but every cell, and, and the spirit and what that spirit vessel is and how it is formed in the biological vessel through, through the course of life and why it's immortal after that biological life ends. And even how that a new biological uh, vessel can be formed from the image in the spirit that's held in the spirit. So we'll get into some of that today. So states of matter, you'll see here now uh, an image, an actual photographic image of a condensate. You can see that it's uh, like a standing wave. It's, it's a coherence zone. In other words, each one of those points is, is not like a separate atom. The states of matter as you see uh, in, the, in the, the image here, this is an actual photographic image of a, a microscopic view, highly magnified, of a condensate. Now in a condensate, you see the, the, the points here, they're, they're all in a coherence zone. They're, they're coherently arranged like a crystal lattice structure. And they're not material in form, they're waveform. So they do not act as separate atoms. This, this could be hundreds of atoms of, of a particular uh, mineral, but not acting as atoms, not as separate quanta, but acting as a single quantum and in, in a uh, form of a wave. So it has very different characteristics. It's super fluid and super conducting. Uh, and so that gives it the, uh, uh, as, as these, the size of this type of a, a, a lattice uh, energy field expands into the macroscopic world, it continues to have the functional characteristics of the quantum world, which means things can bilocate, they can translocate from one place to another without traveling through the space in between, they can move through apparently solid objects, they can take up the same space as another object. Uh, so all of those kinds of characteristics that are the, the, the quantum weirdness of quantum dynamics, the, the, the world of the subatomic physicist, and the world of the spirit, the world of consciousness. So this is, uh, for, at first just becomes an analogy, you know, if you read books on quantum physics, uh, dancing woolly masters or whatever, you, it's, uh, the parallels are drawn between the world of consciousness and spirit and the world of the subatomic. But with the macroscopic presence of condensates, we have the actual explanation for that macroscopic appearance of these same characteristics, the characteristics of the spirit at our co level of consciousness and level of, of uh, biological entities. And, and I will propose at the level of cosmological entities as well. So uh, the condensate considered colder than a solid because it's at a, it's at a low energy level in terms of, of thermal energy. There's no random uh, thermal energy involved here, and it's actually not thermally coupled with the environment. So we can actually have in a biological system a condensate that's essentially at close to zero degrees Kelvin in its function without it being coupled or being able to uh, absorb the, the, the thermal energy, the random energy in the environment. It's highly coordinated, highly coherent in its nature. And part of the function of uh, condensate is that because of its superconductivity, it sets up a, a field that repels outs the influence of outside fields, including thermal energy from, from the biological matter that, that it uh, co-inhabits co the body with. Okay, so 
Uh, and of course, solid, gas, solid, liquid, and gas. Let's take a look at what's at the other end of the spectrum in terms of our conventional thermal view. We have plasma, as you see here, illustrated by a, uh, a plasma ball, uh, uh, which has a, uh, 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 a uh, Tesla coil as the, the energy source, very high frequency electrical energy. And it, we know if you've I'm sure you've seen one of these plasma balls. Uh, they're, they're really fun to play with. You put your hand on, like you see in the image, and, and the, the, these lines of electrical energy move, shift and move like, like, uh, the, like an octopus or a squid leg, just like a biological type of, of movement. Uh, and in fact, the reason that the, the, uh, the physics state of matter is called plasma is precisely because of this characteristic of electromagnetism and how it moves, just as in a biological system that uses plasma, uh, biological plasma uh, of cytoplasm in the cell and, and uh, plas uh, the uh, blood plasma in the blood, uh, all of our extracellular fluids, there's, these are our, our plasmas, uh, unless they're structured water, which is uh, a coherent zone, that we're going to propose is a, a uh, carrier then for condensates because of that coherence. It, it draws the, the presence of these condensate minerals to form into, they have a preference to form sheet-like structures, just like uh, we use today uh, silicon in sheets in order to process information in computers. Well, the biological system also, we propose, uses sheet uh, crystalline sheets of, of condensate minerals that are the carriers of consciousness, carriers of spirit, uh, <clears throat> that tend to organize in the sheets, in those sheets of, of uh, structured water, of living water. The, the pi electrons that, that stick out from those sheets and form a coherence zone because they're all, uh, they all have uh, equivalent uh, energy, energy levels. They, they are no longer quantized into separate electrons, but they act as a, a sheet, a pool, a, a coherent zone of electrical, uh, present electrical energy. <clears throat> so, so again, the, the reason that uh, the, the cosmological plasma, the state of, state of matter of plasma in physics, is called plasma is because of the similarity in structure and function and movement uh, <clears throat> that we have in biological systems. It, it forms into these, these lines that, that, that move and, and can wrap around each other. They tend to form in pairs, in, in, in double helix pairs. Uh, <clears throat> and and the, the double helix of the DNA also forms a coherent zone of its pi electrons through the, the sugar rings on the two molecules as they coordinate. So it forms a perfect antenna for biocommunication. Here in the next uh, picture, we're just illustrating pla biological plasma. Again, both the intracellular cytoplasm, we call it, it's a plasma, that's where the word comes from, and the biological term plasma preceded the physics application of the term plasma. Both the biological and the physics plasmas are electromagnetic energy carriers. They're, they're in, in the case of the biological system, we have a water base. In, in the picture here, you see a micrograph of a cell. Uh, you can see the, the dense DNA in the, in the center uh, <clears throat> absorbing light, absorbing biophotons of, of biocommunication into the DNA. And, and the response of the DNA is what we call epigenetics, the tur turning on and turning off of gene function. The plasma itself is a, uh, a water, watery fluid that has electro, electrolytes, salts, uh, that are ionized, that therefore, because that, of the, those ionic charges, are able to carry uh, electrical currents, electrical energy. And here we see at the, at the upper left a, uh, a, an artery, a vein, and a nerve. So uh, this is called a neurovascular bundle, and, and that's how both nerve and, and blood uh, functions are, are carried to our body tissues. In fact, the, uh, the anatomical 
definition of an acupuncture point is where one of these neurovascular bundles goes from the deeper tissues, penetrates through a layer of fascia, which is a connective tissue that's an insulating layer, electri electrically insulating layer, and then distributes itself on the surface. So we can actually measure uh, the, the, the impedance, the, higher, the lower impedance, the higher conductivity, in a sense, uh, if it were a wire into the deeper tissues of the body. And because of the, the holographic representation, as we see in every cell, the holographic representation of the DNA to the functions of the cell or to the body as a whole, the fractal function of that to the whole body, uh, or as we see in the iris of the eye as it maps in iridology to the body or in sclerology or in reflexology of the hands and, and feet and in uh, auricular acupuncture, the ear, the homunculi, homunculus uh, in the, in the in the sensory cortex or the motor cortex, throughout the body, the body maps to itself in a unique way, in that a certain point in the brain will map to a certain uh, function in the body or a certain sense or a certain organ or a certain tissue, and we have that, again, repeated over and over and over, down to the level of every cell. And so the same is true for the acupuncture points. Uh, this was recognized uh, 5,000 years ago and, and uh, codified actually through, through uh, war wounds, through puncture wounds and, and recording of the, uh, the, remote, uh, the remote effects on health and, and experience, sensation throughout the body, uh, changes in symptoms, for example, uh, when there was a puncture wound in a particular spot by by correlating those, they were able to, to lay out a system which now, uh, for example, when, when radio opaque dyes are injected into one of these points, the dye is, can be uh, photographed uh, by uh, radio photography, uh, basically x-ray. They can watch the movement of that dye and it flows in the direction that the meridian is recorded to flow and uh, those are in opposite directions from one radian to the next. And it uh, forms a little circle at each acupuncture point where that dye is able to flow through this uh, opening in the fascia where the neurovascular bundle penetrates. And there's many very interesting studies on the, on the acupuncture points, for example, where they can measure the shape of the point, the, this actual plasmoid, this area that's unique has a unique characteristic. It's like an antenna. It's a little eye, actually. It's a sensor to the environment and a transducer between the environment and the body. And, and it, it signals its link to a particular internal area and function. When you place an acupuncture needle into that acupuncture point, its shape changes. It changes from a uh, sort of egg-shaped spheroidal plasmoid to what looks like a Birkeland current, a, 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 uh, an extended and, and uh, uh, spiral uh, that wraps around the cylinder of the, the electrical conductor of the needle. In the next image here, we see the, uh, the pole of the Earth. Uh, There's probably North Pole, I think. And it shows the... <clears throat> The ring of co connectivity, where where the uh, Birkeland currents from the sun as the uh, the main energy source in our within our heliosphere in our in our solar system, where that electrical energy uh, enters the the Earth's pole at the poles in in a ring. Uh, and I'm proposing that the interior of the, of the Earth. Uh, it, it is, I think, is likely to contain a uh, the, a core that 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 has condensate functions. There, there may be metallic uh, presence as well in, as in the conventional model, but condensates can also take up the same space as those metals. And so uh, you can visualize that energy flowing through the pole area, the circumpolar, and, and traveling into that, that core uh, superconductor con uh, through resonance with a sup uh, similar superconductor in the sun, and similarly at the, at the, the center of the, the galaxy. So we see here in the next image at the top, 
the magnetosphere of the Earth in relation to the sun and the magneto tail. So this is, shows where the energy field of the sun, uh, the, what's called the solar wind, but that wind is, is ionic because it's a plasma. Uh, so it's not just an ionized gas, it's a plasma, and that carries electromagnetic fields and flows along the magnetic lines of energy in, in the space. <clears throat> and then in the next image, we take a little bit bigger view and we see the sun in the center and the sheets of the current sheets that expand out spirally from the sun. Uh, and if, if one of those contains a large amount of, of ionized matter, uh, then <clears throat> that could potentially knock out all of our electromagnetic systems here on Earth. Uh, <clears throat> something like that happened in the 1800s where it actually melted down the wires that were carrying the long distance communication at that time with the telegraph. And here at the lower right, you can see an image of measurements uh, by the Pioneer spacecrafts as they get to the end of the heliosphere, the, the heliosphere, the heliopause, the, the, the edge of this plasmoid, this uh, plasma structure in space that is formed by the solar wind, again, the solar plasma current of these spiral sheets going out. They get to the edge and then you leave the area of influence of the sun's energy field and you uh, <coughs> enter the, the field a very different energy level of the, the galactic currents, galactic field. So the, the point is that, that these plasma structures are, are the same. Essentially, they have the same shapes and functions uh, at, at cosmological scales as well as at biological scales and, and smaller scales, uh, you know, down to single cell. <clears throat> and uh, so at, at least, uh, I think, 16 or so, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, scale uh, uh, orders of magnitude of scalability of plasma structures that have been actually documented in uh, uh, laboratory studies. So uh, the next image shows, again, taking a, a bigger view back into the cosmos, we see from the side uh, our, our galaxy, the Milky Way, is the line, the line across the center. So that's the, the plane in which the material, the, the, the stars and planets and all that, the arms or spiral arms in that plane. And then you see the two plasmoids that have been documented now that extend out above and below the plane of the galaxy. And there's a current that, that flows out from the center into those, to form those plasmoids and then recollects into the spiral arms which move around the center of the galaxy actually move at twice the speed of the, the, uh, the normal matter uh, and, and is the energy flow that drives that uh, in the form of what uh, pl <coughs> plasma physicists and, and, and electrical engineers would call a homopolar motor. And then uh, this next little diagram shows that, that current, the direction of the current flow from another perspective. But you can visualize those plasma spheres on there. So that's a little bit about plasma and that taken back into the scale of our bodies and cells. Plasma uh, is in the liquid state of, pla of biological plasma, carries electromagnetic currents uh, through what we call the meridians, but it's not fixed. These are not wires. We don't measure uh, resistance or conductivity like we would in a wire that's insulated. They're not insulated. One meridian flows into the next without a layer of fascia to divide them. There's fascia dividing an organ from its exterior. There's fascia dividing the, the skin from the interior, internal organs, again, with openings for neurovascular bundles to, to flow through. So there's these portals, these eyes, elect electric eyes, as we'll look at, as we'll see them. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, it's programmable, it's sh it shifts and changes. And so when we measure impedance, which is the measure that's equivalent, similar to, to resistance in a biological system where we don't have perfect insulation or, or relatively uh, little insulation, 
just like in the plasma ball, uh, the Tesla ball, Tesla coil, plasma ball, the, those those uh, little fingers of, of electromagnetic current that we call Birkeland currents, they move and they change. And the same is true in our meridians. The energy flow in a merid meridian can shift and change and, and coordinate with another meridian and combine with another one or help support and stimulate the energy flow in that other area. There may be a blockage in one meridian and the energy flow will bypass that area, which we may experience as pain and a lack of detoxification uh, and, and per symptoms peripheral to that point of blockage. So that all can be measured electronically with uh, elect German diagnostic electroacupuncture and other, other methods. Uh, Japanese have methods of Ryoto Raku, uh, the, the French Noget method can measure it with, with points on the ear. So there's multiple ways of measuring these systems. Because it's fractal and holographic, we can uh, tap into that, that fractal holographic uh, uh, reflexology basically in, in a number of ways. So let's talk now about, about the uh, fourth phase of, of matter in terms of water, fourth phase of water, the liquid crystal water. Uh, we see a diagram here comparing, uh, comparing on the left just bulk water, the model of bulk water. It's just kind of moving around randomly. There may be little clumps and clusters, but we really had no clue until fairly recently that water will structure into this form on the right, which is very similar to ice, except the distance between the hexagonal sheets is much closer, and that's why when ice, when this water uh, crystallizes into ice, it expands because the sheets are further apart and they become coordinated where the holes in the sheet are directly one above the other, uh, whereas in the water, they're di at a diagonal. So the, the water on the left does not freeze into ice, it has to go through this intermediate stage in order to do that, which is probably why you can get super cooled liquid uh, water and, and then a little input of energy. It actually takes some energy to create the liquid crystal form, and that energy can come from, typically it comes from photonic energy, light energy. It can, it's uh, the crystal itself, the liquid crystal water absorbs, it has a peak absorption in the UV, and an even higher peak absorption in the near infrared extending into the far infrared. So for example, heat energy, infrared uh, photonic energy emitted by our cells can be absorbed by the living water in the body and actually is stored as charge separation, meaning it's creating a battery effect of separation of charge. Pro protons are forced out of this easy exclusion zone water when the structure forms. So it is act literally a battery, and, and the larger the coherence zone of that battery, the, the higher the frequency of photon that can be resonated and, and given off by that to enzyme functions that are in contact with that water. Again, an enzyme is a protein, so it's, it's, it's uh, hydrophilic and therefore will, it is highly capable of forming this kind of structured water around it. Because it's fluid, it can form shapes, it can, it, it's not a, a fixed, rigid plane as in a, the ice crystal. Uh, and again, it's gonna draw the spirit minerals in condensate form into that structure for biological consciousness, for the spirit body. It can move in and out of that structure without disrupting it. So let's look at that next, the condensates, the a little phrase I like is spirit matters. It matters is a double meaning, obviously. Spirit matters in healing. Well, why is it important for us to improve people's health, function, their vision, their consciousness? Because we are conscious beings. You know, we're not just lumps of matter that need to be put in a proper shape in order to be a cog in a, on a wheel to make a machine work. We are actually developing through life, becoming who we ultimately are outside the context of space-time. So we're here in this womb of heaven, the earth, in order to form, uh, form ourselves into our, our future self, as I call it, which already outside the context of time and space, which spirit is, it transcend, it's transcendent of that. That's why we can think of the future, we can remember the past, we can have visions of the future that, that, that are true uh, true representations, veridical perceptions of the future. 
one wonderful series of studies uh, that's come out shows how uh, subjects viewing slides will respond to uh, certain slides are put in, in the loop, you know, and they're randomly presented according to uh, uh, a random number generator in the computer, and certain slides have, have a, a, a tremendous amount of emotional impact. They might be, you know, of some injury or some danger. And uh, when a person views those slides that are emotionally, uh, that there's an emotional re response or reaction to, it's measured, the, the physiological response happens before the slide is presented. Not only that, it happens before the computer determines the random number that will present that slide. In other words, there's a reverse time biocommunication, and it comes from, it's been identified, it comes not from the brain, but from the heart. So the spirit consciousness, which is centered in the heart, has this trans-temporal biocommunication, this ability to communicate with future and past in a, in a meaningful way. So uh, Bose-Einstein condensates uh, are uh, condensates of bosons, of, of of quanta, quantum substances called bosons, for example, photons. And as I mentioned uh, in 2010, uh, specifically photons themselves were found to form condensates and actually have a mass. They had two mirrors extremely close together, and it's like a hall of mirrors, and the photon is just resonating back and forth between the two, and that sets up a condensate state where it ha the light energy then has a very different different uh, characteristics, including mass. Uh, an, another perspective on this is to look at electrons. There's a model of the electron as essentially a condensate of photonic energy. If you, uh, if you model a, a half wavelength track of a photon, it comes back on itself uh, and, and one full wavelength would make two cycles around that track. And the electromagnetic characteristics of that are those of the electron. It's a, it's a perfect match. As a famous physicist, I uh, like to describe matter is frozen light. And uh, the model fits. So, uh, we have... Uh, other types of condensates, solid quasi-particles called magnons, excitons, polaritons. Uh, these condensates have characteristics that are very different from normal matter. They're the characteristics of spirit and consciousness. They're superfluid, so they can move in and out of material objects, can go through walls can go in and out of the body, like an out-of-body experience, the spirit moves out of the body, and we see, and because the, the spirit is the, contains these condensates that are the substrate of consciousness, it's the spirit that's seeing. It's not the brain that's seeing. The spirit sees through the brain when the spirit is having an in-body experience and locked into the, the, the cell membrane, the coherence zone in the cell membrane. Uh, we know that... Uh, we know that <clears throat> anesthetics, general anesthetics, that, that destroy consciousness temporarily, at the same time, they destroy the uh, coherence of the microstructure of the cell membrane, and they, uh, <clears throat> the, the stronger their partition coefficient into the, into the lipid phase of the, the cell membrane, it's general anesthetics, they all contain fluoride and chloride, chloride groups, which are, are halogens that are highly reactive, highly, uh, you know, they're close to the end of the periodic table, and so they want to add that one more, one more electron. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, they're superfluid, superfluid, superconductive, which means they will form their own energy field and repel outside energy fields. They're very stable, and that explains why uh, the spirit body that can hold a memory intact over decades of a lifetime uh, and, and resist outside influence. So it's sort of self-governing, self-organizing, self-navigating. Uh, and uh, they can be in a li liquid or a gaseous state, uh, perhaps also a solid state. 
So uh, there are fermionic condensates. Fermions are formed by, for example, by two electrons together form a Cooper pair. That Cooper pair then both, instead of being in, uh, in normal electron pairs, we think of them as having two different spins, and so, so those two orbits can coexist, but they're at slightly different energy levels. They're, they're distinguishable one from the other by their spin. In a Cooper pair, the two become one. They're identical. They're no longer quantized as separate electrons. When we have a whole area of those Cooper pair electrons, that becomes a coherent zone or condensate of electrons. And I think that's what's happening in uh, the pi electrons of, of liquid, uh, of, of structured water in the biological system, the living water, and also in the pi electrons of the DNA. Okay, and that can form a superfluid, superconductive liquid. And then there's ORMS, or ORMIS, that's uh, being uh, used by, by us in modern alchemy and clinical alchemy, where the, the uh, these are also called M-state minerals, or uh, orbitally rearranged uh, monoatomic elements, was the orig origin of this ORMS that David Hudson was able to patent and show that he could take a metallic transition metal, take it into this ORMIS state, the spirit mineral state, and take it back to a metallic state and have completely different characteristics characteristics that we're talking about with condensates. It's a condensate-like state. It's also called a high spin state, a high spin of the nucleus. It's, it's where the, the material substance is much smaller. It has uh, typically about only five-ninths the mass presence of, of, a, uh, of a metallic form of the same mineral, uh, but <clears throat> it has a much larger energy field due to this superconductivity and has the can coordinate with additional minerals in the same state into a, into a planar sheet structure. And that sheet structure uh, that, that has the information carrying capacity uh, qualities of, of a two-dimensional uh, computer chip also still is, is super fluid. It can go in and out of the body and it can bilocate. It can, when you think about someone in another place, your, uh, those minerals can actually bilocate and become, create a wormhole between those two locations in space or space-time. You can think about the future, about the past, and actually have a real and measurable energetic effect at that point in space-time. And this has been shown by studies both in remote healing and remote viewing, where they're able to measure quantum energetic effects of the healer or the viewer when healing and accurate vertical viewing was actually taking place at a remote location. Pretty exciting. Because it tells us something really more fundamental about vision and how vision works, that it's, it's not merely a, a psychological uh, illusion that we're projecting our visual image out into the world and creating this effigy of the world in more or less accurate projection. It's the case that we are actually projecting quantum energy into the world. We are creating the visual world that we're seeing, and we're actually having an energetic impact upon it through our intention, through, again, the studies with remote healing and remote viewing. It's, it's clearly, you know, we, we know clearly that the effects are there, but we know that those are, are energetically uh, mediated quantum effects through some of those quantum studies. So coherence zones, when they organize into macroscopic levels, we see this, this function of quantum no, non-locality. We, we, we can accept it at a level of subatomic physics. Oh yeah, it's just a weirdness of physics that at a quantum level, things are non-local. Or you know, an electron that's, that's, that's localized here as a quantum also has a field that extends to infinity. Now, on, on, on that level of physics, it's been viewed as a probability field. But when we're dealing with consciousness, it's, it's not a probability field, it's a directed field. It's, it's specific. If you're thinking about a specific place, the more accurately you're able to think about that, the more accurately the quantum, uh, it's a, not a non-locality effect, I would call it a quantum translocality effect. And again, it's trans-temporal as well as trans-spatial. Uh, we have coherence zones in, in the cell membrane. We have lipid rafts. We have the aqueous pi electrons that I've been talking about in sheets. 
We have the DNA pi electrons. They're in the double helix form of the sugar, uh, the sugar residues of DNA. And we have photons that have been shown to form into, uh, into uh, <clears throat> coherent zones that have mass, for example. Uh, different characteristics than what we're accustomed to thinking of. So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, we've talked about states of matter. Let's talk about the phases of health. Now, this is a, a central uh, part of the clinical theory of everything. It's actually the biophysics of terrain based on the bioelectronics of Vinson, which is uh, a technology that goes back to about the 1930s when uh, Vinson was hired by the nation of France to study water quality. He measured the physics of the water uh, to, to measure the, energe the energetic quality of water, uh, which is one of the things he wanted to measure as a physicist. Uh, he, he, there were three measurable characteristics that go into what's called the Nernst equation to measure and to calculate the microwatts of energetic content in that water. Those three, uh, as, as, I, as I view it, are light, electric, ele electrons, electricity, and, and the magnetic factor of protons. Uh, and so those are measured by, the protons are measured by pH, the hydrogen potential, the hydrogen ion potential, H plus, or in water, in an aqueous medium, H3O2 plus. Uh, and uh, we have electrons are measured by RH2, the, the, the hydrogen, the molecular hydrogen potential. If we measure the hydrogen level as H2, the, the diatomic hydrogen molecule that is made up of two protons and two electrons, it's a measure of how many electrons, because if we have excess protons in an acid state, if we add electrons, such as by earthing, grounding the body to the earth, as other species are uh, doing all the time, and we uh, prevent ourselves from doing by wearing rubber-soled shoes and tires on our cars, and buildings that are isolated from the Earth's Schumann field and, and grounding, uh, we become elect electron deficient. And therefore, we, we have this need for uh, taking in extra antioxidants. Why? Because an antioxidant like vitamin C or vitamin E uh, is also a vitamin, which means it's an essential form of a mineral complex, which when it's used, when it's spent as an antioxidant to when it's oxidized, it's no longer a vitamin. It's destroyed. It can be recycled in some cases, but we need other antioxidants to recycle it. And we'd rather keep our vitamin C, thank you, to function as a cofactor, as a coenzyme, as, as a vitamin, rather than using it to prevent oxidation because we're isolated from the Earth's electrical field. It's a very powerful field, uh, 100 volts per meter approximately. And it varies with the cosmic uh, energy field and, and the weather, which shows up as weather. OK, so uh, and the, the phases of health then relate to the imbalances, the relative levels of, of light and electrons and protons in the biological tissue. So if we start from the highest level of health, phase five, where we have a balance, where everything is functioning properly, and we have this living water that's actually going to push out excess protons and toxins and waste products. It's going to have an alkaline state internally. It's going to push protons to the outside, which show up as an acid mantle on the skin, show up in acid urine, show up in acid stool. Uh, so the outside is acid. The inside is, is alkaline. And that's in a state of harmony and balance. Uh, when, when we shift down from that state of balance, we go to, that's phase five, balance, uh, we go down to phase four where we need to cleanse, where there's an excess of protons, also an excess of electrons, there's an excess of energy, but it's not the right energy. You can have protons and electrons in the form of toxin or in the form of a nutrient. So one works very differently than the other. So in the phase four cleansing terrain, there's an excess of energy in the form of of high uh, RH2 and high uh, low pH. Low pH meaning a high proton concentration. So we're acidic, a lot of protons. It's, there's a lot of electrons as well. There's all this energy. We need to get rid of the excess and balance out into phase five. And then uh, the next level down, or what we see in terms of symptoms in phase four is allergy and toxicity symptoms. 
So for example, when Binsan measured community water supplies that had a high energy, these were uh, mineral waters from volcanic sources, and there's a high amount of energy in there, but it's not all the energy that, that you need, it's excess, and the body would have to detoxify that. And he found that, there, that uh, most of the causes of death on death certificates in those communities at that time were uh, from heart attacks and you know, certain types of diseases that showed up in that terrain from toxicity. Uh, then phase three, we drop down to a, a lower level of energy where we're not able to detoxify. What happens is the cells, some of our cells die. They're overwhelmed by this wrong energy and the cell dies. Now we have dead matter. What grows on dead matter? If we go in the forest, we see fungi recycling that. And the same will happen in the body. This is the terrain that grows fungi. It's still acidic, but it's oxidized. It's lost its electron content. And when we drop down to, and this is still happening outside the cells. It's in the, in the connective tissue, in the, the milieu, the terrain in which every cell lives. When we cross over the cell membrane and we start blocking, toxins get in and block cellular enzymes, uh, we now have the terrain for bacteria and parasites, phase two, rejuvenation terrain. We need to rejuvenate the cellular function to where the cell can take care of uh, breaking down food that otherwise becomes food for parasites and food for bacteria. Bacteria can only grow in the right petri dish, and that's true in the body as well as in the lab. As uh, uh, Pasteur and Bechamp uh, argued back and forth in the mid-1800s, uh, and, and Pasteur certainly won the argument uh, in academic circles, and that, that, that philosophy still rules, except for, like last year, Centers for Disease Control in, in, a, in a, a press conference announced the end of the antibiotic era. And it really is, we were learning enough about the microbiome, we, we were seeing the limits to antibiotic therapy, uh, at least in the form of, of, of uh, fungal toxin analogs, uh, you know, following on from the success of, temporary success of penicillin as a fungal toxin. The fungal terrain in phase three is the opposite polarity to phase two bacterial terrain, and so it does work to change that terrain. It'll put, it could put you in a fungal terrain when you take an antibiotic, and you might wind up having a fungal infection after you take antibiotics. That's a problem. It can also be suppressive and go deeper in the cell and block the bacteria that we call mitochondria, which is really, ultimately, in a way, it's, it's more core to who we are. It's where 90% 90, 90 of our energy comes from uh, when the cell is functioning properly. So that can be blocked, and we can be put in phase one terrain, low energy terrain, where we then are at risk for viral infection and for worse, for chronic degenerative diseases, including cancer. So that's the basic outline of, of the terrain, of the five phases of health, uh, and you can you know review that in the chart here, where it shows the low pH acid milieu on the right, and this is clinically as measured in the venous blood. So we have to consider always that what's happening at that layer in the plasmoid system in the fractal is can be different than what's happening at a at another a deeper level. So when we go to phase one and say oh it's too alkaline, yes, and What's happening inside a cancer cell is very acidic because the acids aren't getting out, they're not getting into the venous blood, they're not being removed, so we don't, we measure it as too alkaline in, in the venous blood. And that doesn't mean, it, it's not a linear system. So we have to think non-linearly, we have to, it's why we need a clinical theory of everything to get an overview, to be able to make proper choices and to interface with biocommunication to understand the response characteristics of this system, which is gonna to be to some deg degree unique in each individual, because do you know which organ is in a phase one state and which one is in a phase four state? Do you know when it shifts? Do you know, we, we know a little bit from symptoms, we know a little bit from even from the BEV blood testing. It's a systemic measure, but what's happening on an individual cellular level? We need to know uh, what's happening on, on these different levels in the body. And so uh, here we're, we're looking at an image that, that illustrates the five phases of health and the terrain of, again, like a Petri dish in the lab. If you want to grow viruses, like in that lower left uh, quadrant of the image, you see viruses attached to a cell membrane. 
you have to supply the virus with attenuated cells. If you have cells that have enough energy to grow a bacteria, it won't grow a virus. The virus will never reach the cell membrane. The cell has too much energy. There's still some of that energy, some of that uh, structured water, layers, maybe millions of layers on the outside. And a virus is not motile. It has no, no flagella, no, no motility, no ability to move itself. It's a passive motion. It has to be drawn into the cell just like heavy metals have to be drawn into the cell in that low energy state. So upper left, you see the alkaline reduced quadrant of, and you see bacteria here, rods growing. And uh, in the lower right, you see uh, an image of a fungus growing in phase three where it's acid and oxidized. Again, dead matter is what, what fungi grow on. Uh, and uh, they'll produce acids like vinegar, for example, is a product of that. Uh, and then in the upper right, you see a green algae structure. Green algae, not that it would be growing in our body necessarily, but the green algae is something that grows in that kind of terrain, so we use that. And it has a therapeutic effect of shifting us, if we eat it, into that phase four cleansing terrain. It's balancing and cleansing. So it's a, the illustration there. Uh, here's a diagram from the clinical application of the five phases of health called Bioelectronics of Insan. A uh, description of the Nernst equation, where we look at protons, electrons, and photons, and how those are, are measured. Uh, clinically, it's by pH RH2, which in America, we're more familiar with o ORP, oxidation reduction potential, as a measure of ox oxidative status. Uh, and they're related, but they're not exactly the same. Uh, and, and then ionization, uh, uh, which is light when, when quantum energy is absorbed by a uh, compound, let's say sodium chloride, and it ionizes into sodium and chloride ions that can carry electricity and, and conductivity in the, in the system. It's that quantum energy that, that separates that, that uh, ionic bond that, that uh, <clears throat> makes for the electrical function. So light energy is at work. In fact, every, every, uh, every chemical reaction <clears throat> is takes place only when there's a certain quantum of photonic light energy uh, that, that is absorbed by the substrates that forms then the reaction complex in order for the reaction to happen. What an enzyme does is it, it reduces that quantum. It, we bring in a, a laser-like mineral or vitamin held by, an, by amino acids, by an enzyme, a protein called an enzyme, and that it actually, it, it fits like a lock and key structurally into the, the substrates, uh, but it doesn't have to be in that proximity. If it's in the presence of the structured water, the quantum ener energy works like a remote control. It actually can be beamed anywhere within that coherence zone. So that's the importance of reaching a higher level of health where things work better. For example, there are actual studies that document this with insulin and insulin receptors, that insulin uh, fits right into the insulin receptor. We know that, it's like a lock and key, and that's the model that still prevails. It's a, a you know, it's, it's a material view of, a, of the material aspect of the universe. The thing is, that's not all that's happening. There's also this quantum energetic resonance function so that when a cell is healthy and there's this, these layers of structured water, as soon as that, that mole single molecule of insulin touches that coherent zone of water, the energy is transmitted to all parts of that water, the shape, the, f the function, that, ener that quantum energy resonance, that, that frequency, that, that amount of energy to form that activation complex is the term is formed instantaneously and it's, or at the speed of light, I'm not sure, it's such a small distance and I know the studies haven't been done on that, it's probably at the speed of light, uh, would be my guess. But there's other factors, other things that are transmitted in real time and even reverse time as uh, mentioned a little bit. Uh, so let's say at the speed of light, it's been shown to, that one insulin molecule turns, activates, eight, about eight, average of eight insulin receptors on the cell membrane. So it's a, like an infrared car door, op, car, uh, uh, garage door opener. You push that button, and if it's keyed to resonate, resonate 
with those eight doors, they're all going to open at once. It doesn't, the lock fits in the key, but it doesn't have to fit in the key. It can project its shape information and its quantum energy level uh, at a distance, which is, makes sense, like why insulin resistance starts to happen when our energy level, cellular energy level gets low. It's, uh, it, it gives us additional ways to begin to uh, design and implement changes in the system in order to heal. We don't just have to inject insulin. We don't just have to make more insulin. We can use in near infrared energy and, and, and uh, like the intranasal and transcranial near infrared treatments that are being studied for, uh, for example, for Alzheimer's, which is also called diabetes of the brain. Uh, why are we seeing functional improvements? Because we're energizing the water, so the same amount of insulin can get the sugars in more effectively to the cells that need it. They can make more energy and, and recover, recover function. So in phase one, it's all about that. It's energizing the cells. It's getting the water energy level up, which cleans out the, the terrain of, of unwanted toxins and wastes and acids and carries energy, stores energy, transmits that energy as needed, and the larger the coherence zone, the higher the frequency available, and therefore more and more functions come online just from the cell water battery. Phase two, we're rejuvenating, we're repairing the internal mechanisms of the cell. If you have energy, you can now replace damaged enzymes, you can rebuild the cell membrane, you can, you can rehydrate the cell. Uh, things start to work better, so functioning better in, in phase two. And that can be a rapid turnaround phase. That's where we see the 3,000 cases on record of, of uh, spontaneous remission from cancer, even, even uh, cancer that's, that's, uh, that's metastasized throughout the body can clear in, in a few days with a high fever, with a bacterial infection. So do you want to give an antibiotic and cure that bacterial infection? I don't. I'd rather go through a healing crisis, manage it, yes. You know, keep the head temperature, the head temperature down below one, 105 or so, uh, so you don't have brain damage. But the body is intelligent, and it goes through its own healing processes that we should respect and, and utilize. So uh, <clears throat> we call it rejuvenate. It, when, when, when phase two is going downhill toward phase one, we see rapid aging. When we can reverse the process, we actually see reverse aging. And we're rebuilding the enzyme systems, which are the workhorses, because the enzymes then lower the activation complex quantum energy needed for, en for uh, reactions to take place. So therefore, uh, more and more of those uh, pathways begin to open up and the cell functions, the tissue functions, the organ functions better, the system functions better. In phase three, when we're moving toward health, we're regenerating, which is because if instead of the, having to rely on a fungus to break down our, our, our dead matter, our waste products, <clears throat> if our own immune system can go in and clean out that space, we create space and flow for a new cell to form. If an existing cell has the space and is missing its neighboring cells, if, if it has enough energy to where that cell can divide into two cells and those two cells can have a functional energy field, then, then the cells will regenerate. In cleansing, we're cleansing the, the extracellular space. Uh, and again, as the structured water grows on the outside of the cell, it will literally push from one cell and out from another cell, and the, cell, the distance between the cells is limited by collagen. It's like cables or ropes between the cells. There's also space filling uh, molecules, gags, and that sort of thing. And there's also uh, uh, elastic molecules that, that, that can give and take uh, elastin. But collagen is a limiting factor to how far apart the cells can go, unless there's damage to those collagen fibers. And so when that space gets filled with this structured water, it reaches its limit and, and the water, structured water from one cell meets the structured water from another cell. And the only way, where it place that the acids and wastes and solutes can go is into the open-ended lymph, lymph vessel. Or by pressure, can, they can be to some degree uh, absorbed into the capillary bed, into the, into the venous drainage. 
so that's obviously another a new mechanism for cleansing that we can understand. Now we could use near-infrared, for example, on an area to stimulate uh, lymphatic drainage of that tissue, as well as energizing of the cells. In the phase five balance, when we're on in a good track, not moving toward toxicity, but moving toward greater harmony and balance, we're dealing with external field. We're dealing with life stresses. <clears throat> and this is, uh, this is internally reflective of the hormonal states. You think of cortisol, you know, when we're stressed, cortisol levels go up. We're dealing with life stressors or any kind of stressors, actually. So that was the clinical theory of everything uh, in terms of phases of health. Let's look at photoenergetics. Photoenergetic physiology uh, is what I call the, um, the fact that light plays a quintessential role in how li life works. Again, in, in the, the, three, the three measurements that we can make that determine energy in a, in a quantum, in a physics uh, sense, in, by Nernst equation in a, in a biological tissue fluid, light is one of the three factors. And it's responsible for ionization, which is responsible for the ability to carry electromagnetic energy through that tissue in the form of the meridians, which integrate and coordinate with each other in solving the issues that the body encounters. It's, it's the, the, the unconscious or subconscious intelligence. And uh, so we have, in, in the, the, the modern quintessence of physics, we talk about matter, you know, of, like protons is the, the quintessential material essence. We have the proton, we have the electron of electricity, we have the photon of light, and then there's dark energy and dark matter. And so I think that in, in, in our view, the uh, directions that are being explored, the interpretations that are being made for dark energy and dark matter, I believe are, are off base. They're not finding what they're looking for because they're looking in the wrong direction, I believe. But I do believe that, that dark energy and dark matter in another form are quite meaningful and uh, bring about a completion of the whole picture. The dark energy we can look at as the energetic function of consciousness where these coherence zones are able to then incorporate and draw in uh, and, and uh, crystallize the crystal lattice structure of the dark matter, the spirit, which then is, because it's superconductive, is able to hold the, the electrical and light and, and pho, uh, phononic or sound energy flow patterns of consciousness, of the, the content of consciousness. So I see dark matter as the condensates that are the substrate of the spirit, the, the holy grail that holds the consciousness, and dark energy as the energy of the consciousness itself. I'll give you an example of a recent study. They uh, had a subject in a totally dark room in a scintillation chamber, and they were able to measure when when the individual was visualizing light, so you close your eyes, you're in a dark, totally dark room, not just a regular dark room, a special scintillation chamber dark room, so there's no photons floating around, and then you visualize the light. When the per subject visualized the light, they could measure photons of light coming from the visual cortex. So when the spirit, the consciousness, produces that image, it does have a physiological effect, there's some leakage, from that that's, that's measurable in the form of photonic energy. So that's, that's how I'm looking at uh, the consciousness and the spirit. <coughs> the, 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 that's like the body, the, the, if you look at body, mind, spirit, that's the mind, the consciousness, and the spirit, the, the condensates that hold these uh, phonons and photons of consciousness, of, of thought, of awareness of memory, of intention, etc. Uh, and, and in that super conductive, super fluid uh, substrate, there is no resistance to the flow of that energy. In other words, that structure, unless it's disrupted by some very, very powerful energy field, uh, it, or unless it takes in additional information and grows in an evolutionary way, uh, it's immortal. We are immortal. The consciousness and the spirit are immortal. The body also works on photochemistry. Every, as I was describing, 
uh, just to review, every chemical reaction is a, takes a quantum level of energy. The level of energy is higher if we don't have an enzyme in place. It's lower when the enzyme is in place. And if the enzyme, if we don't have living water, the substrate and the substance, the, the, the two substrates that are going to interact uh, have to actually physically be in contact with the enzyme and fit in as they do, they will fit in in a lock and key model. But the, the ability of that, uh, that enzyme to catalyze multiple actions at a distance at the same time is, is uh, produced by the, the living water as a, uh, a milieu that grows onto the protein, uh, the, the, the hydrophilic parts of the protein. Now, when we eat, we're actually eating light. The, the, the quantum energy, the energy that runs by all biological systems on Earth uh, in most species, almost all species, is ultimately from sunlight incorporated by plants through photosynthesis into carbon-carbon bonds. We eat that food our, in our mitochondria, little bacteria in our cells that produce 90% of our energy. They oxidize that, they, the electrons are freed from those high energy bonds and go through a series of cascading uh, enzymatic reactions where the energy is transferred into a high energy phosphate bond. That's the model that we've all studied in school. We don't always put it into perspective to understand that we're eating sunlight that's been stored in a, a plant uh, chemistry. And maybe an animal ate that, we eat the animal, it's still the same light from, from the sun. Uh, there are species, there, there are, there's uh, bacterial species now that have been uh, proven to be able to live on electrical uh, fields alone uh, and theoretically based on the, the uh, living water resonance and, and that coherence zone being able to reach a higher level of coherence. In other words, if your whole body is one coherence zone, the plasmoids that are, are uh, emitted around that will actually get to I mentioned that there's three levels of plasma. There's, there's a, dark, uh, a dark mode, which is what our plasma would be in right now around, around our body. And we can visualize it still. If we use curling photography, we can see that there's actually a halo around there. But you can go into a glow mode where you know, a halo can be seen around the head of a person who's in a coherent, coherent state. And uh, then finally, lightning would be the, the third <laughs> Sparks, discharge, would be the third mode, the highest energy mode of plasma. I don't know if we want to reach that level. <laughs> uh, so, so we're eating light. Uh, light is the ultimate nutrient. And we can eat it, we can absorb it through the skin. The studies on, on sunlight now show that the warmth that we feel from sunlight on the skin is not only from the infrared, which we've conventionally thought of as heat energy, you know, yeah, that would feel warm, there's infrared in the sun, sure, I'm feeling heat, but the amount of heat we feel is caused by a combination of the infrared and the visible light. So our skin sees visible light as heat, feels it as heat. And every cell is ultimately a little eye, electric eye. That's how, again, the energy field around the cell is, is brought in and the DNA resonates with that and changes its shape to accommodate the environment for our survival. The absorption of, of light in the form of nutrition is in the small intestine. Well, the small intestine resonates with the retina of the eye, which is where we absorb the photons directly in the eye. So an interesting correspondence there. Uh, the <clears throat> I talked about biological water absorbing infrared and ultraviolet. So these coherence zones, the living water, the more living water we have in our system, these are, these are areas that absorb UV and IR quantum energy from the environment, and therefore the more of that absorption space we have, the more efficiently we can absorb energy from the environment. There are now uh, multiple cases that have been uh, documented by modern medical methods of, of breatharians. You know, it's not suggesting that, that, that we should uh, attempt you know, strive for that state, but it's, it is a state that the human body has been documented to go into where every, the energy that we need to sustain life can come through the breath and through light from the environment.
quite theor theoretically quite possible. Uh, <clears throat> so we've talked a bit about biophotonics and bio uh, and, pho and photoenergetics. Photonic biocommunication is the next topic. So what we're looking at here is the, the fractal nature of as above, so below. That, that and what is an eye? What's the nature of the human eye? You know, it's a specialization of what we will see in every cell, in every organism. The, the, we mentioned the rafts of lipids that when they're co in a coherence state are, are functioning and the, the, the whole membrane is functioning uh, in consciousness and when it's disrupted, we lose consciousness. And these are, are little vortices through which the uh, nutrition comes into the cell, or when it's closed, the nutrition doesn't come into the cell. And it's, uh, we can see similar structures at every level. We can look at the vortex that's a galaxy. We can look at the vortex of, of uh, in, in nature, like a hurricane or, or a tornado. Uh, and these are just now be, beginning to be studied as far as their electromagnetism, that these are expressions of electromagnetic discharge in the circuit that connects the sun and the earth. Uh, when water goes through a vortex, it actually produces the, the living water. It produces sheets of water that separate charge. So there's an electrical uh, energy production in a vortex movement. And uh, if you look inside the body, we see that the, the structure of a mitochondria is essentially very similar to the structure of a laser. And we know that from uh, Professor Fritz Popp's work that, that our cells give off, uh, the mitochondria give off coherent laser-like light that is received by other cells, even thousands of cells away, despite the background energy uh, of, of light coherent light, because it's laser-like, it does not lose its informational, its ability to transmit energy and information across larger distances. And the, most of the mitochondria, for example, in our, our nerve cells, live on little fiber optics that are uh, the, the, the uh, microtubules that function as a fiber optic to focalize and carry that, that light even more efficiently. And they move up and down those fiber optics in the cell and they send their signals along them. And when we're in a low energy phase one state of a neurological degenerative condition, they just sit there. They're dead in the water, in the dead water. 